So I thought what I'd do is I'd give you a bit of a background of my experience of going from academia to uh, going into the commercial world. I came out from England after doing a degree and uh, a PhD in genetics uh, in, in, at Sheffield, and I came out on a three-year contract, and that was in 1984, and I've not gone back. Um, I'm glad I didn't go back. What I did is I took up a position at Auckland University as a research fellow, and then I became a lecturer and a senior lecturer, and um, I stayed too long. That was the reality of it. Um, I was in academia for 21 years, and so I'm a, I, I shifted my career sort of a little bit later in life than you're thinking about at the moment. My background at the university was in extremophiles. We worked with high temperature organisms and low temperature organisms. So I was lucky enough to get a couple of trips to Antarctica where we had organisms that were growing in the dry valleys of, a, dry valleys of Antarctica, which is the coldest, driest, windiest place on Earth and things grow there. So life has this ability to grow in the most extraordinary circumstances. And from that, we had a resource, which was the enzymes from those organisms, that would also work in extreme conditions, and we could make commercial use of them. Now, for quite some time, we tried to raise money through the government, through academia, and that didn't work. And I think anybody that's been in academia understands the, the frustration of trying to raise money through grants and through the government. And we felt we had enough intellectual property, enough IP, to actually spin out and become uh, a company, become a small biotech company. I had these plans. It was dead easy. We had this brilliant technology. We'd raise a bit of cash. We'd work hard, and in five years' time, I'd retire a millionaire on a yacht and become a, a gentleman scientist. After seven years of working at it, I was sleeping on the office floor under my desk because I could no longer afford to stay in the trailer park I'd lived in for the last five years because we'd had to cut our salaries down. There were only two of us left, and the company was bankrupt. So I'm waiting for the Netflix show called Microgem because we had good CEOs, bad CEOs, good times, bad times. We had, um, we had a, an attempted hostile takeover. We had a bankruptcy. And we had corporate pirates who took our IP and put it into a small company in the British Virgin Islands. It's been an extraordinary ride. So the best way to describe Microgem is a roller coaster. And right at the moment, we're higher than we've ever been. We're doing well at the moment, and I'll take you through that. So what we did was we took this technology, which was our extremophilic organisms and their enzymes, and we developed as our first product a new way to extract nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, from various substrates. We were working with forensic science, we were working with microbiologists, we were working with medical people. And the way we did it was because a lot of the uh, nucleic acid extraction methods use low temperature enzymes, they compensate for that by putting detergents in there. And when they put detergents in there, they then have to spend the next few hours removing those detergents by purification steps. We figured that if you don't do it like that, if you do everything that in, in conditions that's compatible with what you want to do at the end, then you just basically use the enzymes and your DNA or RNA is there ready to use. And that allowed us to move into an area <clears throat> which I'd, was unexpected to me, and that was into automated equipment and machines. So one of the things we did is we acquired a company based in Charlottesville called Microlab. We were called Zygem at the time. <clears throat> we uh, acquired this company, and they were expert in, micro, uh, in, um, in microfluidics. So they were good at pumping tiny amounts of liquid around and processing those liquids. And that's really where the name Microgem came from. The key thing I learned from all of this uh, is that 90% of your success or failure will lie on your CEO. 
and there's a lot of people out there who will come for you. We've got through about seven CEOs, and they'll come, and what they are really good at is really good salespeople, and what they can sell better than anything else is themselves. So the first thing you want is a CEO who doesn't have an ego, somebody who isn't trying to push what they want to do. And we were very, very lucky. We picked up this CEO called uh, Jeff Chapman. He came from Danaher, which owned Beckman and a, a lot of other things. And he was very, very high up in the field. I'll tell you how high up he was. When I left the university, I think I was given a bottle of wine as a leaving present. He was given a Tesla. <laughs> OK. Now, Jeff is also unusual in that he has a PhD in biochemistry. So he's a great businessman, and he understands the science, and he has all of the contacts, so he knows what he's talking about. And things were sort of going all right for us. We suddenly started to take off, and we took this quiet ascent in the company. Our revenue was going up each year. The number of staff was increasing in the company. We became an international company. We had about 28 staff at the beginning of this year. And then COVID hit, and it did quite the opposite to us than what it's done to a lot of other companies. Because when COVID hit, they needed nucleic acid extraction, and there was a massive shortage. People could do the diagnostics, but they couldn't get the extraction kits out there. So we were, given, uh, we were given essential worker status here in Dunedin, and we worked with teams of people to develop new strategies for getting uh, RNA out of, uh, uh, out of viruses from nasopharyngeal swabs. And that went well. And then about two months ago, um, <clears throat> my CEO rang me up on a Sunday and said, an opportunity has arisen in, news, in, in the USA the NIH are realizing what chaos there is in the United States with the COVID, and they're putting up a significant amount of money in order to develop strategies for getting uh, diagnostics for COVID. And so he said, we've got to get a grant application in. The NIH gave the whole of the USA one day to write a grant application. Jeff got the grant application in at 2.30 a.m. in the morning on the west coast of America, and he was number 2,332 on the grant applications. So the chances were looking a little bit bleak, but he put it together and he'd done his homework, and we'd all been working on it. And it was worthwhile because what the U.S. government was, well, the NIH, the U.S. government was... <laughs> <laughs> the NIH did is they said if you get through this first round which we did we'll give you 600,000 US dollars for four weeks work so it was really worth doing and we got that $600,000 for four weeks work but it was absolutely grueling because in that four weeks we had to prove that we could get RNA out of coronavirus we had to detect coronavirus at a limit of detection that is be was better than any other commercial product on the market. And we had to do the full diagnostic from swab to result in under 15 minutes. So it was a big challenge, and we thought, well, we've got $600,000, you know. <laughs> if, if we fail, we've already won the jackpot. Well, we didn't fail. We succeeded in doing it, and the NIH were very impressed by what they did. So they've just given us, two weeks ago, $41 million US, so that's $60 million New Zealand, to get a machine out. Now, that sounds a vast sum of money, and it is a vast sum of money. But it's also an, an, an incredible challenge. Because by December, we need to have 10,000 machines made. We need to be producing um, the disposable, which is a plastic cup and qPCR little gadget, 120,000 a day. And that's got to accelerate up to a million a day by February. I mean, it's, it's, it just seems pie in the sky, but we're all working on it. I had black hair three weeks ago. <laughs> you know, we, it, it is the most stressful 
times that we've done it. Now, it's a vast sum of money. There were only 35 of us in the company. There's no way we could do that. The reason why we got this money was so that we could subcontract out to other people. So immediately we took on Dana, um, Invitec, which is an instrument, uh, an instrument, a medical instrument uh, uh, design company, and we took on the whole company. 80 new engineers were brought on board. We've had to take on FDA specialists, ISO specialists, all the regulatory specialists. We've had to take on design for manufacturing specialists, designers, instrumentation, plastic injection specialists, you name it. I would never be able to do all of this. Jeff Chapman, it's his hobby. It's what he sort of enjoys doing. And it's got to the point where the scale of the project is so big that um, none of the companies that actually make this sort of stuff, injection molders, will take it on. So Jeff's just bought a factory in New Hampshire and, um, he, and he's taken on 180 staff there and 120 staff in China. So I don't know how big the company is now, it's, it's left me behind. But there's jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and we need you straight away, please. Um, so we're looking, what, we, what we've done is um, Dunedin is our biochemistry research and development arm. We've only got 10 of us in the company at the moment and we need more people. And we're taking on people as fast as we possibly can because we need, we, we, we need molecular geneticists. We've just taken on an engineer. We have the engineering over in the States, but we just need people to do work because we're, we're a little bit overwhelmed. So, anybody want a job? <laughs> So please do come, do get in touch with us and, and come around and see us. It's, it's very exciting, it's very stressful. We've got more to do than we can imagine doing. Um, but if we pull this one off, it'll, it'll be great. But I'll tell you, the 41 million US dollars won't be enough. So the company will have to expand in order to, um, in order to get the goal that Jeff has set us all. So I'd better go back to work now. <laughs> Thank you.